Hey all, it is I, Anthony the Canadian Guy, and welcome to WrestleSode, the solution to your wrestling information problems. WrestleSode is a member of the Win Column Sports Network, so remember to check us out at wincolumnsports.ca to be kept up to date on everything happening here in Alberta in the world of wrestling. Today, I am talking with Monster Pro Wrestling's heavyweight champion, Mitch Clark. Yes, that's right, Mitch Clark, former MMA superstar. It was a really fun chat. We obviously got to talk about how he broke into the business, how he uh, had his time in MMA, how he transitioned into professional wrestling, and of course, his time in wrestling. Not only that, but we also answered a bunch of your fan questions, and it was really fun chat. But before we do get into that today, we're just going to make a couple of quick announcements. Obviously, COVID-19 is still rampaging across the earth right now. So, you know, social distancing is still very important because of that. There are no local wrestling independent shows. And uh, I'm trying to bring as many interviews to all of you as I possibly can to make sure everybody's staying nice and entertained during this weird self-isolation time. So before we get into our interview with uh, Mitch Clark, let's hear from our sponsors over at the Win Column Sports Network. And then let's get into our interview with Mitch Clark. From Lanny McDonald to Daryl Sutter, Mark Messier to Kale McCarr. Before you're a star, you've got to make it in the AJHL. On Saturday mornings, TSN 1260 takes an in-depth look inside the Alberta Junior Hockey League. Join Tyler Uremchuk from 9 to 10 a.m. for previews, reviews, and interviews from around the AJ. Inside the AJHL, Saturdays from 9 to 10 a.m. Only on Edmonton Sports Leader, TSN 1260. Hey everyone, Anthony here. I am joined with the MPW heavyweight champion, former MMA fighter, Mitch Clark. Mitch, how are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I've been asking this question in the most recent interviews, uh, just because of the weird times. How's the COVID-19 situation treating you? Are you doing okay? How's it, how's it affecting your life? I'm doing well, you know, like the, for, for me, like I'm still doing school work and stuff like that. And you know, I'm staying active. I have dumbbells and kettlebells in, in my house. And, you know, I, I'm kind of an introvert anyway, so it's not too big a deal. Minus I'm home all day with, with the pup, so I got to take him out more. But on that, everything's pretty normal. Yeah, I've noticed that a lot of people who were born from, like, let's say, like, 1983 to, like, 1999 are not having that many issues right now because they're like, yeah, this is kind of just my everyday most of the time anyways. <laughs> yeah, it's I have a huge movie collection, so if I get done that, then then everyone's in trouble. But uh, <laughs> until then, I'm good. What's the first movie that you would go to? What's what's your go to movie? The Thing. The Thing. Oh, OK. So we got a classic horror fan over here. Hey. Oh, yeah. Like I've done uh, another podcast, the, the Terror Table. I've done it a couple times. And, you know, like it, you, you, you think you're a horror fan. And then you, you hang around real horror fans and you realize you've just scratched the surface. It's kind of like probably when you hang out with, with real re- pro wrestling fans, you're like, oh, there's there's levels to this fandom. Oh, yeah. there's I, I can completely <laughs> understand that. I've definitely met my, my multi-tiered level of fandom in wrestling. And I, I, I try to stay around like the mid to high range because I feel like – but after that, I'm just like – I'm just going to be lying if I said I knew everything that was going on in Japan in the 60s because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, so let's chit chat a little bit about Mitch Clark. So you've got quite a storied career already up to this point, but where did it all start? Who is Mitch Clark? Where are you from, buddy? Uh, I was born in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. So uh, don't spit on me. I would never know. <laughs> That's just the backwards town when it comes to wrestling fandom. I know that, but <laughs> you know, it it just brings out certain things in people. So maybe they change a little bit when they go back over there. Um, yeah, I was born in Saskatoon. I was born and raised there. Uh, went to, you know, uh, I wrestled, started re- like freestyle wrestling in, in high school. Kept that up. I, I wrestled uh, club when I went to university the first time. I have a environmental science degree with a minor in chemistry and moved here to, moved to Alberta to work for Alberta Environment as an environmental protection officer. And when we, 2008, when we hit the the recession I just went fighting full time. I was already fighting before that. I had three three or four pro fights before I started fighting full time, mm-hmm. and it seemed to be going okay. Won uh, national title, won won a couple things. Went to the UFC, had some success, had some I don't know why I say failures, but some learning experiences, and you know, and then transitioned after that. But go back to school, did what I originally wanted to do, which is pro wrestle, and here we are. That's awesome. So I, I'm actually kind of curious. So how did you actually start in fighting then? How did how did that world kind of come around for you? Uh, well, so I did seen the 
the old UFCs because on my Rogers video account I had the like the parent sign off where like I could rent whatever I want. And right across from sci fi and horror and stuff like that was the UFCs and the pro wrestling. So, you know, like you'd transition between, I'd transition between all four because I'm a mega nerd apparently. <laughs> And, you know, so I'd go between all four of those and I'd seen the old UFCs and I fell in love with, you know, I always loved pro wrestling, but I fell in love with some of the, you know, the the old, the Ultimate Ultimate 2, you know, or Ultimate Ultimate 1 with Dan Severn and Don Fry and all those old school, Ken Shamrock, all the old school guys. And then when the Ultimate Fighter came out, I just, I just finished kind of wrestling my second year and I was kind of done with it. And... I still wanted, like, I'm hyper-competitive, so I wanted something to do, and, you know, I saw the Ultimate Fighter. I'm like, oh, I'm a wrestler. I can I can beat up people. And then I went to a gym, and I got the crap kicked out of me, and I signed up for three months right on the spot, and I've kind of been, you know, just going from there. You know, it's been, it went pretty good, I think. No, it went really well for you, actually. I'm not a huge UFC guy. I'll be the first one to completely admit that. But I actually sat down last night, and I watched your match that you had against uh, Brandon MacArthur, which was, uh, they said it was your sixth win, but according to your Wikipedia, it said it was your seventh win. I don't know specifically, but I remember watching that match, and I was like, the reason I actually really enjoyed watching you was because you were very, like, pick your spots. You weren't, like, just jump in there. You were playing very positionally. And as soon as you grabbed them, it's like, it was over. Like, you just threw him to the ground, and... That was basically it at that point. <laughs> what I've noticed about fighting is you get two very, very different uh, types of people. You know, the fighters where they just go out and they go, they just go. Then you get the tacticians. They, they, this is why guys like Greg Jackson, GSP, they, you know, they really know the game so well so that they can tactically figure out a strategy that works for every person. It's like human chess when you do it right, in my opinion, and I kind of follow that adage a little bit more I'm, I'm i'm above i'm above normal athletics but i'm below like the superstars like the super athletes so to make up for that athleticism i use the fact that you know i, I use strategy i use i i can think in fights you know what i mean and then you don't see that very often where people can make adjustments on the fly and that's gave me an advantage is you take your time you can figure you can you can reverse engineer things and moments into getting to what you need to get to. And I found that that was a very interesting part of, of fighting. I really like that, how you said that, because as actually, it's funny enough you say that. I play chess every day. So all about positioning and picking your spots and, and, cho and like choosing the right moments is like something that I really enjoyed. And that's exactly what it felt like when I was watching you uh, in your fight. It was, like, it was like I was watching you read every moment and like just – analyzing like is this the right moment no let's pull back let's analyze let's readjust he's moved this way everything felt like you were calculating like every second and that was really cool to see yeah and so like it it, it keeps you keep you on your toes what do they call it in um in chess when when you're playing like eight moves ahead was that eight deep yeah well there's a whole bunch there's like other yeah. languages it's weird but yeah that you can go like eight deep is pretty much a good common phrase you know and you always are trying to play that ahead and then you have to be able to on the fly make these adjustments have these strategies to go a certain way and off another another route your backup plan you know uh my coach jeff monero he was always big on you have plan a but you have plans b through through m all the way to z if you need it you know and that's that's how i think about it I love that. That's great. I love hearing like a tactician kind of talk like that. That makes me really happy. Now, I don't want to lie. I've pretty much exhausted my knowledge of the worlds of UFC at this point, but I do have a couple of questions when it comes to MMA and also wrestling. Was there any like standout wrestlers and MMA fighters that you really gravitated towards people like a Dan Severn, a Ken Shamrock, a Minoru Suzuki? I, I really like, I used to really enjoy um, Ken Shamrock, you know, especially I've met and I've cornered Dan Severn. He's a very nice guy. He's also ridiculously strong and very good at wrestling. You know, he's a world medalist in, in Greco-Roman wrestling. So he's okay, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, Ken Shamrock was a, you know, a, he's kind of where I first started, you know, and he was always, he was the shoot fighter. And it really kind of like, it, it had this intrigue to it, watching like D WWF for, at the time and then WWE. 
but he, he had this like the world's most dangerous man. Like that's that's a cool moniker, and you know I was drawn to him, and then Kurt Angle as well because I wrestled. So you get that uh, you get that connection there because you know like if you take a look that that guy what he did was amazing. You know to win a gold medal and breaking his neck in the semis or even before that, you know, and still winning and beating an Iranian at the time who were the top dogs at those weight classes, you know, is, is amazing. And, you know, he, those were the guys I thought I really kind of had a cool connection to. They weren't who I always loved the most, but, you know, he, as a, you know, a quote unquote shooter, those are the guys you kind of look at. Was there any one specific that you felt like you tried to model yourself after? Would you say it was the Ken Shamrocks? I, you know, a, a little bit. I wouldn't want to model myself too much because, you know, unfortunately, every every shooter shoot guy that you know a guy comes from MMA or you know another combat sport into in into wrestling tends to use him as the prototype, and he has a very niche. Um, you know, he, he's very specific in what he did. You know, he was he, he was crazy, you know, he was dangerous and that kind of thing. And, you know, the more I watch wrestling, the more I break stuff down, you 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 want to be, you want to have that kind of like that edge, but you don't want to like just rip it off you know, or use it as a prototype because it's very much just him. And so as, I, as I'm learning and trying to get better, you try and add – you know, pieces of other guys that are, you know, close to shoot style or whatever, you know. I think my kid's a good example. You take all the all the radicals that came over from WCW to, to WWE, they all have, you know, a good model to kind of use, and you pick what you connect with and use those as a model as opposed to just picking one person, I think. You know, like imagine if, if Dan Severn would have got the personality aspect, he would have been really hard to deal with. He had a good move set, you know, he's a He's a good wrestler. He's a good real freestyle wrestler, and you know it was just like people couldn't really connect with him. You know, and probably part of it was the belly slaps at the beginning of every match they like doing to himself, and that or having wrestling t-shirt. You yeah. know, so <laughs> that's that's just my opinion. You know, Shamrock lays laid laid the ground for for some stuff, but you know, I I think that there's other guys you can really really pick from that are really good. You know. Suzuki and he's another example of the guy who's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, to say the least. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, actually, let's transition here into the world of wrestling. Let's move down the shelf at the movie at the movie store. So you <laughs> said you grew up watching wrestling as well. So like when did you break into wrestling? Um, obviously, you said you, you, you gravitated to people like Ken Shamrock. But who else did you enjoy watching growing up? Growing up is a different story. Um uh, you know, I, I love that, you know, the quote unquote that golden age, you know, the the eighties and the beginning of the nineties mm -hmm. uh was where I really had that connection because you know, I was growing up and that's that that's really who pro wrestling, you know, that that sparks that love is is at that age. Uh for me I really liked uh you know, obviously Macho Man Randy Savage, anyone that kinda has seen me that sees the little bit of you know, the uh, homage, I call it homage. You know, I'm a bit of a Macho Man Mark, but at the same time, I love uh, Bret Hart. Um, you know, guys like Dean Malenko, Chris Benoit. When I was growing up, I used to love WCW. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I loved Hogan and Ultimate Warrior. And when you grow up, you realize the limitations of of what they of what they do, what they how they wrestled, and then, um, but just the charisma they had was second to none. Well, I'm yeah, trying to think else was I crowd really so well. You know, I, I you won't hear this very often, but Perry Saturn was someone I really enjoyed watching. You know, it's funny when Perry Saturn made his transition because I was the opposite. I was the WWF kid, so I wasn't that huge into the WCW world. So I got to see Perry Saturn when he came over to the WWF, and I was like, "All right, this guy's pretty good." But then they got him stuck with that mop gimmick, and I was like, "What?" And then I actually went back and watched proper yeah. Perry Saturn, and I was like, "Oh, this guy's actually awesome." Okay, I get it now. Exactly, you know, so it, it, it's tough, you know, because it's like most people, they especially near the end, they were all WWF and WWE and were not on the WCW train, and all they get is Moppy and Saturn, you know, and it's unfortunate because he was a very talented wrestler, and uh, like how he moved in the rings was fun to watch, so he was someone I thought was really cool to watch. 
uh, from the WCW days. That's awesome. Those are all great choices. Um, I got a couple more questions for you with that. Like, how about these days? Do you have any wrestlers that you still enjoy watching these days or that you gravitate towards? You know, uh, I, I really like uh, I like watching Tom Lawler. He's fun to watch. I've met him in person a couple times. He's he's huge. Like, I don't think people realize, like, how big he is in person. Like, he's one of those guys who's as wide as he is tall. <laughs> um, super, super nice guy. Really funny. Uh, I like watching him. You know, I've been watching uh, more and more AEW, which has been fun. Uh, one thing I gotta say is, like, I, I like watching Chris Jericho and and how he's he's evolved oh so much in the in the past two decades. Like, he just so fun to watch. Um, what's his name? Ricochet. I thought I I like watching, uh, and that's because. When we kind of like we, we dumped our cable package, so uh, what was it? Luke Underground was on Netflix, so yeah. I watched that a whole bunch, and I love Prince Puma just because of the stuff he did was was amazing, and it's it's still what he's doing is amazing. So I like him and Pentagon and those guys. So you know, there's just so I who else I like, and I did mention earlier, and I should have is Josh Barnett. He's fun to watch. Those are all great answers. And I always really like running into people who actually watched Lucha Underground because I watched the first season of that as well. So I learned to love Prince Puma and Johnny Mundo. But doesn't Mil Muertes have the worst pants in the history of wrestling? Like, oh, my God, is <sighs> blue and white stripe drives me insane. Maybe maybe that was that was the idea. Like sometimes, you know, like some people pick the bright, obnoxious colors because they know it just like gets under people's skin. It looked like pajamas to me. Like he was getting ready to go to bed. That's what I felt like. He was putting on his bananas and pajamas pants. Anyways, <laughs> I still liked him as a wrestler. Solid though. reference. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> but uh, I got a couple more questions here for you. So you and me are approximately the same age. I mean, I think you've got a couple of years on me, but you were definitely, it seems like, a child of the Super Nintendo era. And I have a question yep. here that I got from Twitter. I pulled uh, Twitter and got a whole bunch of different questions back. And I got a question here from Paul from the YYC Wrestling Hub. And this one, I feel, is a very important question for us to start with. And he says, <laughs> you once told reporters that your favorite video game was Turtles in Time for the Super Nintendo, which is awesome. Just for the record, I love that game. I always loved Baxter Stockman's <laughs> level. I'm a huge tur uh, Turtles ner uh, nerd myself. I was a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, the arcade game for the NES guy. But that's just because Solid. me and my friend could just beat Shredder without doing anything. Like, you couldn't move. Anyways, his question specifically, <laughs> do you have a preference for a particular turtle? I was, uh, I'd always switch between Leonardo and Donatello just because I liked uh, Donatello because he was in the bow staff. He had more stuff kind of, like, available. And Leonardo because he was my favorite on the TV show, but also... Double double swords, it's always the best. Yeah, man, two katanas is fantastic. I'm a huge Turtles guy. I'm a Donatello man myself. He always felt like he was the best character in other video games because of the bow staff. He had like this impossibly long range that nobody else could touch. So I was a Donatello. Yeah, he definitely <laughs> had his advantages because of the bow staff. So yeah, I agree 100%. I think of like the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game where you just like at the very beginning of the game, you just take the bow staff and you just hit downwards and just beat all the bosses without actually fighting them. Oh, man. Cheap. I, I could talk <laughs> retro video games all day, man. But trust me, that's my world too. But I have another question here from Paul from the YYC Wrestling Hub because we have a whole bunch of them. Um, having fought in <laughs> MMA and wrestling, what are your thoughts on wrestling events like GCW's blood sport shows that intend to mimic the early days of MMA and catch wrestling? I, I think they're really cool. I, you have to do them right, and you have to get the right people for them. And I think they're they're doing that. Obviously, having guys like uh, Suzuki and, and Barnett, you, I kind of wonder like when they put guys like Moxley in there or you take someone who's too MMA like Frank Mir and you put them in there, how how they look. So it, it becomes really tough. So you got to find someone that kind of like he, they understand, you know, they understand that, you know, you got to make the crowd engage and say, I'm just going to do jiu-jitsu because that really doesn't really help anyone or I'm just going to slap the crap out of someone, <laughs> you know? So it's it's finding that nice uh, right in the middle. I, uh, Davey Boy Jr. Um, was was super fun to watch in that. I like I like watching him. Tom Lawler, I like watching that. Killer Cross, I think, was in one, if I'm not mistaken. So those are those are the people I really like watching in that, in that where they understand – 
they shoot aspects of it, but they can still wrestle. That's awesome. Would you ever find yourself in a place like Bloodsport? I'd, I'd love to. But, um, you know, like, some of these guys are pretty big. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, how, do I, how do I put this? I've noticed sometimes people try and take liberties, and, you know, I'm pretty I'm pretty calm a lot of the time, but I, I take so much, and then I'm going to start feeding your own your own hand, you know, unfortunately. Like, I'll, I've, I've tried to explain to people, like, um, there's a difference between like knowing a little bit of of like shoot stuff and then there's like, hey, I trained as professional six days a week, twice a day, three days a week, like three times a day, twice to three times a day and just shoot stuff where like I'm okay I'm okay at it. <laughs> so <laughs> I think you would do fantastic there, man. I remember I think it was during I, I can't remember if it was during your retirement speech or if it was during one of your matches, but somebody said, you know, Mitch Clark isn't the biggest guy, but I don't know a guy with a bigger heart or something like that. And uh, I think that's really what you need. You just need that ability to not get back. You just need to get back up. You just can't, you know what I mean? You just can't fall, I guess, as they say. Yeah, you know, like, I remember one of my old, like, freestyle wrestling coaches, there's a guy who's super talented, and he'd always quit on himself. And I remember him saying, you know, that boy has a lot of quit in him. And I thought to myself, I will not ever be that guy. And I think that that's, that's an important thing. You know, uh, at the end of the day, you can, the only person you're quitting on is, is yourself. And for me, you know, you beat me up, you can break me down, but I'll keep coming. And, and that's something that hasn't left me. Um, let's move into your time now with MPW. So when you, how did you start training in the actual world of professional wrestling? Um, so after I retired, I, so originally I wanted to get into pro wrestling. I was always told I was too small, which, you know, trying to, trying to explain to people that I fight at 155, but I don't walk around at 155. You know, when I was making 155, I'd be 30 hours before and I'd be 176 pounds. So, and that's at, you know, four or five, you know, percent body fat, you know, like you're dialed in. My walk around weight before was probably like 188, 190. And now it's a lot higher because I don't have to cut weight because I hate cutting weight. It's, I'm done with it. <laughs> um, but when I was done and I wanted to get into it, so I talked to uh, Sergeant Hazard. That's the... He's uh, someone I've known in the combat sports community for a while. He's a good person, and I really respect his opinion. And he told me to send a message to uh, Adam Pierce, uh, who's currently with the, the WWE. WWE. Yeah. And he, he told me a couple options. And I sent an email to one one of those options. And, uh, and I, I'm not here to bury anyone, but they said I was basically too old, too small, it would just be for fun. You're not really going anywhere. I didn't really state that, like, hey, I want, I want to get to the show. All these things. I just want, like, I want to learn. I want to get better. I want, you know, I want to wrestle. See where it goes. See what happens. And they kind of like, they kind of wanted to stomp on my dreams. A little, like not even my dreams, just something I wanted to do. Right. And uh, so I told Adam this. He emailed me back and he said, hey, check out this guy. And I was uh, massive damage. I sent an email. He had a trial, like not trial camp, but he had a camp coming up. And I went to the camp and I got to meet Phil. And I kind of I've been training with them kind of ever since. That's awesome. So how long has it been now? I guess that's been what three, two, three years. I just I've been training just over three years and wrestling for about two and a half. So so I know that you've wrestled uh, for a couple of different promotions. I know you wrestled out in Saskatoon for PPW, but you would say that our, our uh, that MPW would be your more home promotion for right now. Yeah, for right now, yeah, that's definitely who like who I wrestle with. I'm I'm their heavyweight champ. You know, uh, I kind of like expanding. I, I use it to you know kind of expand the character and that kind of thing, and really like hone in on because they always people always see me there. So I'm always just kind of building that up and on getting better and better. So I've wrestled, you know, uh, RCW, Super Clash Against Cancer, PPW. You know, I'm always looking to try and expand as much as possible. And cause this, is, this is how you get better is by wrestling different people. And if, you, if you're you a sponge, people give you the knowledge. If you act like, uh, like you know more than you do, then people won't 
then you can't learn from anyone because you're not really open to learning. So for me, uh, I always use every opportunity to learn if I can. If I can work with someone with more experience than me, I'm always happy. And if I work with someone with less experience than me, then I use it as another learning opportunity. You know, you got to have a good attitude, and I don't really care if it's pro wrestling, it's fighting, it's, you know, macrame. I don't really care. You know, if you have a good attitude, you can get better at anything. I really like that, man. You've got such a cool, upbeat attitude. It's like it's infectious. You know what I mean? It's like now I want to go out and like pump some iron or something. <laughs> I probably won't, but you know, I, I need to do that more myself. But I have questions here about that championship now. So I know you won the championship back in July of last year, and you've held on to that MPW Heavyweight Championship since. Um, you've had <laughs> matches against people like uh, Lumberjack, Larry Woods. Um, I know you've also uh, had some other matches against Rich King. Has there been, I guess, a person in Alberta that you would say that you would really enjoy wrestling, um, not necessarily more than other people, but you feel like you've you've got the best flow with that you feel like you're the most comfortable with in the ring. I, I really like uh, I really like wrestling either Rich King or or Lumberjack Larry. Uh, a lot of it is just because uh, we we kind of like we like going at a fast speed, you know, because we're not you know giant heavyweights. Mm -hmm. We we know that we have to keep your attention by doing you know, by keeping the speed up and, and making stuff keep moving. You know, like, I think of it as, like, the old school kind of, like, Dynamite Kid matches where there's stuff going on, and if you if you look away, you're going to miss something. So you keep the people engaged by that. I like working with, uh, you know, uh, T.Y. Jackson is another one. Mm -hmm. uh, he He's kind of underrated. He's also, like, probably one of the best people I've seen sell. You know, like he takes best bumps, sells. He's I like working with him. And another guy is is Jude Dawkins. I've only had uh, two matches with him total, but you know, like with him, I learned a lot. You know, and he, I can go through a list of people I've learned a lot from. You know, I've had matches with with massive damage and stuff like that, and with heavy metal, and you learn stuff. But with um, with Jude Dawkins, I really found that he gave me the why. And that for as we talked about really a lot of it is like thinking about strategies and stuff like that. He really gave me the why of why I'm doing things. Like you can do cool moves, but if they don't there's no reason why, then why am I doing it? Why am I, you know, filling out my bump card? Why am I why am I uh what's my purpose? You know? So so with him I, I learned a lot. So those those four guys I I I really enjoy working a lot. That's awesome. So you're, it's more like the story comes before the spot in every situation kind of a thing. You know, I, I think the biggest thing is I've seen like seen these kids and they're kids because they're younger than me. So they're obviously kids. <laughs> um, but uh, I see these kids do these amazing moves and they're tremendous wrestlers. But because they don't have uh, the crowd engaged with them, they, they don't the, – the really all, all you have to do – all you can do is do a bigger move. That's the only way you're going to keep them entertained. Where, like, you watch some old school matches. I'm not talking about, like, like super old school matches because sometimes they rely on a headlock the entire match. But, like, what I mean is is you can do a little bit, and then when you give them something big, it has meaning. And I think that that becomes is you have to keep the psychology strong in matches, and that's where I'm learning. Like I can I can pick up moves easy, you know. I'm athletic, I'm strong, I can cardio, I can do it. But if there's a reason for it, if the psychology doesn't make sense, then why am I doing it? I love that. I, I like those old school types of matches. I think a good example of that was like Dustin versus Cody last year, where mm -hmm. if, I mean I think there was about twenty wrestling moves throughout the course of the entire match, but every move had such an impact and told such a story that like you were just drawn in the entire time, regardless. Oh yeah, and and I think that that's that's what sucks the fans in. Like it makes them choose like, Hey, like I could go to the washroom, but I'm going to miss something because the story is being told to me and they feel like they're the only one in the room. You know what I mean? And like, that's when you know you have a special moment. You're telling a story. And just like you said, if you could tell a story to the audience, they're more likely to come back for more. 100%. And that's why that match specifically won my match of the year last year, that Cody Dustin match, was because reality melted away while I watched that match. And then I had to realize that I'm like, holy crap, like I just got zoned out for like 30 minutes just caught up in this match. That's how you know it's a good match, right? 100%. You don't look at, you don't look at your watch. You don't, 
it, it doesn't matter. It can be a 15 man match or, a, or an Iron Man match. It doesn't matter because you're engaged the whole time. Absolutely. All right, we got a couple more questions here that we've pulled from the Twitterverse, and then I have a couple of ending questions for you before we do let you go here today. Um, one of the ones I want to end with, though, uh, comes from my good friend Mike the Ref, Mike Malawaney, but we'll we'll get from the, to that one at the end. But I got a couple questions here. Uh, <laughs> this one from Mike the Sign Guy or Mike Ducey. Um, he likes to add the interesting, fun ones in there. Do you believe in cryptids such as Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, or El Chupacabra? And if so, why do you think no one has ever, or one has never been found? Um, note, the cheetah bear does not count as a cryptid. So this all, you know, I, I always like to believe, you know, like I've always believed in like those types of things. The thing is, for me, I don't believe in Loch Ness Monster anymore because like the most, uh, this is going to be super nerdy, but I don't even care anymore. They drained um, the lake, didn't they? Well, they they did sonar. They did all these different things. the The big thing is is the most reasonable explanation always was that it was a plesiosaur, because of like the long neck and it comes in here. Uh, have you ever seen a plesiosaur like the skeleton? I I can't say I've seen the skeleton of one. No. So what happens is, is like the way their vertebrae is set up, they can't they actually can't bend it upwards. It has very little flexion or extension in in coming upwards, so it's very like just a long neck on a straight plane. Right. So, so what people think of would be the make more the most sense where the head comes out of the water and forms that classic silhouette, which was a uh, a hoax, a classic hoax. Uh, that's that's why. Like, so for me, until you kind of like come up with a good uh, potential explanation, I don't. The chupacabra, I don't. I'm not. I'm not super familiar with it. All the all the potential ones have been coyotes with uh with mange and that kind of thing right so uh but i've always believed in bigfoot and all the all the other things for me it's part of it is because i just want to believe in one <laughs> so uh the other reason why is like you you take a look at some of the like the footprints that have been found they have these dermal ridges which is basically like uh, equivalent to like a fingerprint in these in these dermal ridges, so basically, and everyone is unique. And they found several of these. Like, there's obviously a ton of hoaxes, which is weird to me to to try and like <laughs> um, try and hoax that. But I guess whatever drums up tourism. The other reason is is there's always throughout history and in every, most cultures, there's always been the wild man uh, mythos. There's always uh, Russia has one, China has one. All through, you know, North America, there's there's been the Sasquatch, the giant ape, stink, uh, skunk ape, all these different things. So I feel like there there has to be basis for it, and I think that probably it's if it doesn't exist anymore, I wouldn't be surprised. But I think at one point it probably did. Um, you know, I, I always wanted to like always wanted to do like one of those cool like camp out trips where they go searching for Sasquatch. You know, I wanted to start the Alberta Sasquatch Society, but they told me that having an acronym as of ASS, ass I just the heard that. About I... Starting... <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you said it, I'm like ass in my head. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so that hasn't really picked up yet. I, I just think it's cool to believe in it. You know what I mean? Um, I've never found a bear skeleton uh, going out hunting. You know, I, I think all I found – for like a lot of deer, um, deer carcasses is maybe some antlers sometimes ahead, but I, you find very rare, you very rarely find, uh, like the big predators, you know, a car. Yeah, exactly. So you don't really find it too often. So, you know, that might be an explanation or it might just be dreaming about, uh, you know, I think they're cool, but you know, that was my nerdy explanation to the question, which is probably far more than, than necessary, but you know, and in the worst case, it, everyone believes in cheetah bear. There you go. Everybody believes in cheetah bear, especially people in Saskatoon who believe in man bear pig. I think that's <laughs> specifically anyway. <laughs> uh, another question here from Mike Ducey because he likes the ask. What's your favorite Quentin Tarantino movie? Um, you know, it, it used to be Re uh, Reservoir Dogs, which used to be one of my favorites. I really like uh, Inglorious Bastards, to be honest. It's it's engaging. It's different. Uh, the dialogue is really good. As I watch, like, because I watch a lot of horror films, and uh, the wife hates the fact that I, I love the old campy ones that are 
And the, the thing I realized the most that has evolved the most since those times in movies is dialogue. And even if you look at, you know, Reservoir Dogs has pretty good dialogue, but you take a look at some of the ones now and you realize how good uh, the dialogue is, the story's good, everything's really good. So I, I like that one. No, I'm right there with you, and I'll be 100%. I think Inglorious Bastards is probably my favorite Tarantino movie, personally as well, um, And because I'm a huge fan of Christoph Waltz and... Uh, that yep. opening scene, because I speak French. I'm one of those weird guys who speaks both English and French. So that opening scene when he goes <laughs> and he visits the French farmer and, like, they're all under, like, the ground and he's speaking to them in French and then he transitions to English. Like, I felt the chill because, like, I started listening to it as a French person. And then it transitioned to English mm-hmm. and I was like, something's about to go down. And I felt it on that level in the theater. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, it's super cool. Like, and 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 that that's what makes him so good is that that connection you know that he he gets that uh he does such a good job of 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 building that intensity without without using anything too crazy you know like you see it uh true romance is a good example you know what i mean like you you get to see just how good a director he is and how good he is at bringing the best out of these actors and actresses and and building you know, that tense feeling that, that you get in moments. And, and uh, I think that that's what makes him truly unique. I love it for that reason as well. Tarantino is just, he's a, he's a genius of cinema, in my opinion. Um, another question. Uh, so this one I'm actually going to ask, because this is one that I like to ask everybody that I've ever interviewed. And then we will finish off with the best question and then we'll, we'll end up there. But my question for you is throughout history, there has been a million different types of different championships, whether it be a belt or a sword or whatever throughout, uh, you know, the history of wrestling. Has there ever been a championship that if, if, if you, we could say this is Mel- Mitch Clark's championship, you're holding this belt, which belt would you love to hold? I like the classic 80s intercontinental title. I always thought it was the cleanest looking. Um, even with the white leather in the back, I thought it looked pretty cool. That That for me was... Was always the best looking belt, like that the Mister Perfect you. belts kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, you, you get to see all the best guys. Like some of my favorites, always wore. You know, Ravishing Rick Rude, Macho Man, uh, Ricky Steamboat, Mister um, Perfect. They all had that classic style of of the belt, and it was. Just, I think that that for me was the coolest looking belt. So that's. That would be my pick. You and Dewey Robson down there in Lethbridge have the exact same belt choice because he said the exact same thing, which is awesome. <laughs> oh. We can we can fight for it. There you go. That. Well, I know you guys are apparently a big fan. So you said that you're a big fan of Macho Man. <clears throat> and that actually fits perfectly into with our final question for the day that comes from my friend Mike Malawaney. Mike the ref. Um, apparently you do a Macho Man impression. Is, is that true? That is, uh, it is not true. It's something I've been trying to work on, and it's not ready to be displayed yet. Oh, we're not going to get it here today, huh? No, I'll give you a ring check. All so right. So how about ne- next time I'm on it, I'll, I'll keep working on it, and we'll, we'll save that for next time. You know, like it's a reason to come back, and it's a reason to bring the listeners in. I think. But, Fantastic. Like, uh, like you know, uh, remember those Basham buddies? Yeah. That they used to have. Yeah. I have well right now because in. In kind of like the office and stuff like that, uh, I have both Hollywood Hogan and and NWO Macho Man on the shelf right now. That's amazing. All right, well, I'll hold you to that. Next time we're gonna get that impression. Um, but uh, until then, man, plug your stuff. Where can people find you? Where where where, where are you the most active? Uh, probably Twitter. Um, I will kind of preface it with it's a lot of random thoughts and stupidity, but uh, Mitch Clark MMA on Instagram and on Twitter and Facebook fan page. You know, I'm going to probably change the Facebook fan page being Mitch Clark MMA and extracurricular or something like that because plug my jiu-jitsu and plug, you know, pro wrestling on there too. So that's about it. Um, yeah, and and on Instagram, it's a whole lot of like meme posting and pictures of my corgi. <laughs> Well, that's the reason to go onto Instagram most of the time, anyways, is for the random cute animal pictures, anyways. I'm trying to keep it positive, man. Like, especially in times like these, everyone is doom and gloom. You know, I can get I can get doom and gloom if I go anywhere. Um, you get something that makes you smile, makes you chuckle, 
Yeah, you know, absolutely. And I've, I've done my job. <laughs> yeah, keep people smiling, keep people happy. Everybody out there, don't go too stir crazy. This is the time to enjoy yourself and work on yourself. And I mean, I'm only about 19 stars away from beating Super Mario 64, which I picked up last Wednesday. So I will get there Solid. myself. All right. I mean, you got to keep yourself busy in these weird times. <laughs> All I right. find it really, I find it interesting because, like, I've uh, I have a huge Super Nintendo collection and the N64 collection, so I feel like we're getting along just fine. Did you not see the post I put on uh, Facebook the other day, or on Twitter the other day? You may not have seen it. I'm a retro video game collector. I own three N64s. I basically have all retro video ga- consoles connected to my one old school TV that I could play at any moment. Oh, yeah, I did. Oh, I did. I go. did see that. <laughs> So awesome. I think we would That's get along so cool. just fine, man. All right. <laughs> well, you have yourself a fantastic day, and you keep yourself safe, and I hope you and the wife don't go too stir-crazy. And yeah, we'll do our best. Same to you guys. All right. Cheers. Have a good one, buddy. A big thanks once again to Mitch Clark for sitting down with me today to talk his career and what we can expect to see from him moving forward, plus all those fun fan questions that all of you got to ask for him. If you liked what you heard here today, remember to hit that like button and subscribe on whatever podcast app you're listening to this on. It also helps out the show immensely if you gave us a five-star rating and review, if that is what you want to do. Until wrestling kind of picks back up, expect some more interviews here over the next couple of days, and I hope to keep you all entertained during this weird social distancing COVID-19 time. I hope you all have yourself a wonderful day, and I'll talk to you soon. (laughs) 